So this is going to be quite different than what you've just been seeing. I'm very, very much on the um, still the discovery research side of things, and I guess also I'm a physical scientist working in trying to develop materials that might be used in biomedical applications. So it fits in really nicely with Brian, and in fact we've done a little bit of work with Miss Synthes. So uh, um, as Brian took you through, he's on the soft tissue side of things, and we're focused on the um, hard tissue side of things. So hard tissue in um, a medical point of view is things like your teeth, your bones, um, that sort of thing. So that's what we are focused on. <clears throat> So you may have seen this about a month ago on the front page of the Dominion. Um, and this is with respect to, in particular, metal-on-metal -metal implants. So implant technology for hard tissue um, reparation has been around for centuries. It's always been a bit of a brutal um, surgery, and it still remains a brutal surgery now. And um, one of the issues with it is that the materials that we utilise are not very compatible with the native materials that are in our bodies. So if we have a look and think about some of the different types of implants that we have, so focusing first on the metal side of things, so we've got hip, knee, and then when you have a tooth implant. So many, many of these are based around metal-based systems. But one of the things, if you think about the metal-based implant versus the native tissue, is that all of the chemical and physical characteristics of the implant versus the native material are vastly different, and yet we still utilise them. So this area of implant technology for hard tissue implants is still very, very active. Metals are still widely utilised, but some of the things that people are starting to do um, is to explore the differences between the implants that people are using and the native material. So you should recognise this is a, um, a jaw, um, and this is now being utilised and in, fixed, um, in terms of some of the stuff that's been done in the design school here. So this has actually been made using a 3D printer, um, and so what they've got is actually um, powdered metal, and they print that into a three-dimensional structure and then sinter it. And so what you start to be able to get is a variation in the density of the material so that it's much more compatible with the native um, jaw. You can reduce that density of the metal implant versus the native system by also doing extrusion technologies. And so you can now, if you think of um, shaving foam or, or whipped cream or a beer head or whatever like that, then you can actually make a similar foam-like structure from a metal-based system and then make your implant of that, out of that. Irrespective of doing this, you still have an, a metal and you're still trying to interact that with a native system which is a combination of protein, carbohydrate and um, calcium phosphate or ca calcium hydroxylapatite. So the other major class of implants that people utilise are ceramic-based materials, and these are predominantly used um, for any dental reparation, but they're also starting to be used in spines as well. So these are the sorts of um, ceramic-based materials that we utilise quite a lot. Now, if you compare ceramics versus your metal-based systems, the density is a little bit um, more comparable with the native system, but the mechanical or physical attributes of your implant are now not very good at all. So if you think about a ceramic being just like um, a plate, and you know if you drop a plate, what happens is that it smashes. If you drop a piece of metal, that doesn't happen, does it? So these are the materials that are being utilised to repair hard tissue in a huge percentage of the population as it stands at the moment. So advances that are being made in this area are to do things like use stem cells to actually um, act as scaffolds in the formation of the ceramic, and the same sort of foam or extrusion-like characteristics that are being utilised for metals are also being used to make ceramics, and as I said, they're starting to be used in spinal injuries. But the based systems that you're using in a ceramic material or a metal-based system are incompatible, essentially, with the native material. So if we have a look at the native material, the structure for our teeth is quite different than the structure for bone, but I'm just going to show you through um, Havasian bone. So, um, and this ties in again quite nicely into Brian's work. So Brian talked a lot about this um, protein here, collagen. So collagen is also the major proteinaceous material in our bone. And so what you actually have is a mixture of this proteinaceous material and essentially a mineral. 
So just think about going to the garden and digging up some dirt. It's pretty much the same. So you have this organic material mixed with some dirt, effectively, and what the system does is it makes the two interact in a particular way, and what you get out at the end is Havasian bone. And what you see in this system is that you have structure right down on the nanometer length scale range, which if you think about a piece of hair is in this length scale range here in the micrometer, so that just gives you a bit of a reference point. And so if you go down a thousand times smaller, then that's the first building block to get your Havasian bone that's up now in the millimetre to metre length scale range. So just as you think about in an organisational point of view, we talk about a hierarchical structure. Well, we have a hierarchical structure in the native bone as well. So in all of this that we see in the native system, it doesn't correlate even vaguely to the metal-based or ceramic-based materials that people are continuing to research to develop hard tissue implants better. So what do we do? So we've been studying hard tissue in a whole heap of organisms. So generically, hard tissues are called biominerals because they're just minerals that are made by biological organisms. And what you find if you look at um, a whole raft of different biominerals, so that's things like our bones, our teeth, seashells, that kind of thing, you have an organic polymer matrix, and that can either be your proteinaceous material like the collagen in bone, or it can be a carbohydrate like in power shell. It doesn't really make any difference. You then have this mineral, an inorganic mineral base, and so again, the type of mineral that you might utilize depends on the organism that you're looking at, but you always have an organic material, and Catherine will recognize this picture. <laughs> Um, and then you also have additional organic components, so additional proteins or lipids in your structure as well. And they help to both interact with the organic matrix that you have, but also direct what your mineral is doing. So using that basis, what we do is we basically try and generate a system that has all of that componentry in it. So we utilize a system based on a carbohydrate, and we generate the original organic scaffold, which is just, for depiction, a squiggle. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but not much. Um, and so then what we do is that we utilize this template system to actually generate the final composite material that's inherently inorganic material with organic, and the length scale of which is compatible with the native hard tissue systems. And what's more, we make them out of materials that are completely biocompatible. So the essential elements that we make our materials with are exactly those elements that the native tissue systems are made out of as well. So just to show you some nice pictures. Um, so we work predominantly in terms of replicating a hard tissue system at the moment. We work with PowerShell. Havasian bone is a little bit more complicated than the power shell system because the different levels of hierarchy are more involved, so it's a much more complex system to try and replicate. But studies have shown that the compatibility in the native system with um, things like the power shell system are, are quite high, so it's not necessarily bad. So this is the native system on the left, um, and then this is our material on the right. Um, and if you look at it at much higher length scale, you start to see the hierarchical length scales. So um, you see that there are individual molecule, uh, sorry, crystals that are forming to generate the total system. So that's in comparison with those original, if I go back to this one here, hydroxylapatite microcrystals that you have. So we get that same sort of intimate interaction between the inorganic material and the organic component of the system. So I have um, a whole heap of different samples here, but unfortunately there's not a, um, a document projector in this lecture theatre, so it's hard to tell. But these are the materials that we start with. So this is the organic matrix that we synthesize ourselves, and then we can mineralize it. And once it's mineral, it's no longer transparent because you now have those nanometer and micrometer length scale crystals in the system. So where we're at at the moment is that, <coughs> sorry, we're looking to see whether or not which of these three are the, um, is the best way to move forward. So I guess going back to Jonathan's um, market pool. 
So we've been developing this because current implant technologies are not very good. So if any of you have had even just a filling, you know that it probably won't last much more than 10 or 15 years and then you'll have to have it replaced. And that's pretty minor, but if you think about that from a hip or a knee replacement point of view, that becomes major for any patient. So what we'd like to be able to do is start to utilise our materials. Um, as I said, we've made everything from things that are biocompatible and they're all individually FDA approved as well. It doesn't mean the whole thing will ev would ever get FDA approval, but individually they're all FDA approved. Um, we can make, start to make three-dimensional structures, but they need to be low stress. So not a hip or a knee replacement at this point. They're quite tough because they're quite high stress. But in terms of working with metal systems to try and remove metal on metal based implant technology issues, then we can start to actually change the surface of the metal based implants by using our materials. And as Brian said, has said already, um, the human body is very, very bad at self reparation. And he might think it's really, really bad from soft tissue point of view. From a hard tissue point of view, it's much, much worse. So we're not too bad at soft tissue repair relative to hard tissue repair. We're very, very bad. So we may also be able to start utilising our materials to enhance hard tissue reparation as well. But what we need to do now is, as I said, I'm a physical scientist and we need to know what's the best way to go forward. And so what we'd like to be able to start doing is to work with some surgeons and see where the um, biggest issues in the field are and then focus on those. Thank you.